circle fall. Today is my honor to introduce Mary Lynn Campbell, who is um, no stranger to UCLA. She did her undergraduate degree here. She did her master's in African American studies here, and she did her PhD in American history um, in the history department um, at UCLA. Uh, Marnie is a past assistant professor at Kennesaw State University in Georgia, and she was the holder of a president's postdoc at the University of California, Riverside. She has published um, several articles. Uh, many of them are to be found in the Journal of African American History and also in the Journal of Urban History. She currently is finishing her manuscript, which is um, which this talk, I believe, is drawn from today, and it deals specifically with the early black population in Los Angeles for about the period of 1850 until about 1920, primarily, though, focused on the period of about 1872 um, to 1915 or so. So um, if you would like to hear something again, I believe she's going Oh, thank you so much, Professor Stevenson. And um, I just want to quickly thank um, Mark Sawyer and Kelly Lytle Hernandez for suggesting that I do um, this talk, and also the um, African American Studies IDP department and the Bunch Center for African American Studies um, for giving us the space and for um, um, promoting this event and um, I'm really excited to be here today and I also want to just thank those students of mine or former students of mine who um, who came out so thank you all very much. Um, Today I want to share with you a new uh, piece that I'm, that I'm working on that looks at both national and local leadership. On June 27th, 1908, a curious letter left Los Angeles, California promoting a black colony. It read, Dear Sir, I have great pleasure in informing you that I have just completed an organization to be known as the California Colony and Home Promoting Association. The object of this association is to unite with you in creating favorable sentiment for the race. One of the chief purposes of this association will be to mold public opinion favorable to intellectual and, industri and industrial liberty. To this end, I have secured over 9,000 acres of the richest land in Central California of the Santa Fe Railroad. A town will be established upon the most scientific basis and improved methods of city building. As it is just as cheap to begin right as wrong, we will commence with the ownership of public utilities. We intend to demonstrate to the world that we can be and do, thus meeting the expectations of our friends and to encourage our people to develop the best there is in them under the most favorable conditions of mind and body. This we have in California, as you are aware. It is my desire to have our streets given names of historical and educational value. In the midst of this city, we will have a lake surrounded by a park to be named, if you have no objection, Washington Park in honor of the greatest Negro sentiment maker in the world. Have you any objection? Respectfully yours, Alan Allensworth, Lieutenant Colonel, USA Retired. This letter written to Booker T. Washington signifies a connection between national and black leadership and local black leaders that I'd like to center um, my talk on today. Booker T. Washington's idea of racial uplift was one of several circulating in Los Angeles at the beginning of the 20th century. Black leaders around the country disagreed about the ways in which African Americans would attain equality. Some advocated civil rights, while others emphasized economic freedom. African Americans were split over those options. This paper examines the role of black leadership both on the national and local levels. 
In doing so, it considers the interactions of black Angelinos with national leaders and explores the ways in which the local African American leadership address national and local issues. This paper will address the kinds of leadership roles African Americans took on when they first arrived in California. It will compare the agendas of the national leadership and then consider the ways in which black Angelinos shaped their own social and political agenda and how that related to the national agenda at the beginning of the 20th century. The first African Americans in the state were made up of voluntary migrants to the West and in 1850 California was the only state in the region where free-born African American women and men from northern states intermingled with slaves and freed people from the lower south. Noted historian of the Black West, Quinard Taylor, points out, quote, that mix, particularly with its leadership drawn disproportionately from New England abolitionist circles, produced a community capable of protecting its own interests. These small African American communities worked together to help the national abolition cause and to secure the rights of freed people. West was a land of opportunity politically, socially, and economically for all people. Men joined the Colored Convention, which was linked to the National Abolitionist Movement. Between 1850 and 1857, African American leaders organized three colored conventions that were held in Sacramento and San Francisco. African American women organized self-help clubs to provide food and money for the new arrival. African Americans in California, led by the Colored Convention, fought for homestead and testimony rights deseg and desegregation of public schools and streetcars. Black California women engaged in several charitable activities, most of which could be found in the cities with the largest concentrations of black residents. They organized both formal and informal uplift groups and hosted evenings of literature to support local socio-political and intellectual agendas. Most of their charity and fundraising work occurred at the very churches they established. Black Angelinos continued to fall into the 20th centuries, especially as the community became the largest black population in the state. The African American community in Los Angeles can be defined in part by its social, economic, and religious networks many of which fell into the tradition of black self-help organizations prominent on the East Coast and in the South since the 18th century. The local women's Sojourner Truth Industrial Club, for example, assisted working class black women combat low wages and poor working conditions. Black Angelinos also created other social organizations in order to maintain a separate and distinct community that was otherwise closed to them. Blacks already established in Los Angeles opened their homes and rented rooms. Black Angelinos published and circulated a series of their own newspapers, one of it which was the, Los An was the California Eagle, which um, Black Church in Los Angeles, like many other regions in the country, was the first institution operated by African Americans, allowing them complete autonomy. African Americans utilized the church as a resource for establishing and maintaining institutions for spiritual and religious as well as social and political purposes. When most African Americans arrived in Los Angeles, they found themselves drawn to one of the city's African American churches for a sense of community as well as finding those cultural ties left behind. By 1872, there were two churches, um, African American churches in Los Angeles. The first African Methodist Episcopal Church, also known as FAME, and Second Baptist Church. Black members of predominantly white churches who decided to break off and form their own denominations organized both. By the beginning of the 20th century, the African American community in Los Angeles The size of the African American community in Los Angeles during this time period did remain small. Between 1870 and 1910, for example, comprised only 1 to 2 percent of the total population. People of color collectively, and that's Chinese, Japanese, Native American, and African Americans, never made up more than 6 percent of the entire population of Los Angeles. 
By 1910, the African American community totaled almost 7,500 people. Between 1870 and 1910, African Americans purchased property, owned businesses, and worked throughout the city in a variety of occupations, including farmers, teamsters, and boot blacks. By 1910, the majority of males between the ages of 35 and 60 worked as drivers, constru construction work, and by that I mean contractors, carpenters, brick masons, um, and road maintenance. They also worked as janitors, cooks, gardeners, and railroad porters. Women's work often consisted of cooking and domestic labor for private families or they clean laundry. During this time, the African American community in Los Angeles developed their own social hierarchy with class distinctions even amongst themselves. The African American elite and middle class received a great deal of attention from visitors to the region who saw their success as an indicator of the success of the community as a whole. This particular segment of the community impressed W.E.B. Du Bois when he visited the state and highlighted their accomplishments in the Crisis Magazine. He made several preliminary conclusions about African Americans in Los Angeles, some of which were accurate while others were not. This unofficial, field, this unofficial study, which was not as scientific as his other works, had a profound impact on the ways in which most people interpreted the status of African Americans in the West. As one of the most preeminent leaders of the African American community at the beginning of the 20th century, these observations are often the centerpiece to understanding black Los Angeles. On the surface, black Angelinos seem to share similar goals and ideologies as Du Bois. But one must look closer at the relationship between the local and national black leadership of the time. At the beginning of the 20th century, both W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington emerged as the primary representatives for black people. Each one had his own brand of achieving equality. For Washington, the focus was on hard work, economics, and self-sufficiency. Du Bois, on the other hand, advocated civil rights educating the youth, and securing the right to vote. Many African Americans organized around these ideas by supporting agricultural, agricultural and industrial training schools, um, and training, excuse me, by supporting agricultural and industrial training at schools like Washington's Tuskegee Institute, or by joining the politically engaged Niagara Movement and eventually the NAACP of which Du Bois co-founded. While other black leaders reached out to African Americans, such as Marcus Garvey or Ida B. Wells, Washington and not only amongst African Americans, but also whites. At the beginning of the 20th century, both had visited Los Angeles, Washington in 1903 and 1914, and Du Bois in 1913. Most histories of black Los Angeles tend to overlook the two visits by Washington and focus on Du Bois. He did write extensively about Los Angeles in the Crisis Magazine's volume entitled Colored California and published several pictures of African Americans in Los Angeles. In fact, he believed that the city offered more to African Americans than any other place in the country. Du Bois was so impressed, he wrote, quote, One never forgets Los Angeles and Pasadena. The sensuous beauty of roses and orange blossoms, the air, the sunlight, and the hospitality of all its races linger on. Du Bois described Los Angeles as possessing sensuous beauty with wonderful weather and climate that extended to all its inhabitants. He described the African American community as hospitable and called them pushing, as in ahead, and energetic. He noted their efforts in the local economy, their beautiful houses, and the ways in which they worked with other communities of color. Du Bois also believed that black Angelinos worked well with one another to create opportunities for themselves and for the community as a whole. African Americans in Los Angeles, Du Bois concluded, challenged their oppressive circumstances and overcame adversity better than any other city in California. During his first visit, Washington, like Du Bois, traveled to both the northern and southern parts of the state. Washington spent time promoting Tuskegee and made 27 speeches in addition to attending several impromptu speaking engagements, banquets, and receptions. 
He spoke to both black and white audiences and visited several colleges and universities, including Stanford, the University of California, and Pomona College. He also spoke at many churches and organizations. Many of these were filled to capacity and the people had to settle on listening from outside the buildings. Washington began this trip in, um, in Los Angeles and spent many, um, much of his time with many African Americans who were wealthy and influential. On his second visit, Washington socialized with many African Americans whom he met during his first trip. This time he visited several more t churches, one of which was fame. At the first congregational church, Washington spoke twice since they could not accommodate the large crowd. He also addressed the colored YMCA and attended dinner with the very same people that had hosted W.E.B. Du Bois the, the year before. During both of his trips to Los Angeles, Washington was impressed with the accomplishments of African Americans and the treatment he received. Like Du Bois, he was fascinated with the beautiful landscapes, the bountiful fruit trees, and gorgeous weather. He appreciated the ways in which black Angelinos managed their own businesses, their churches, and their ability to secure property. Perhaps the only thing he was more impressed by was the idle gossip at a dinner party in the home of Robert C. Owens, whom also hosted W.E.B. Du Bois. Washington wrote, quote, it seems he made a perfect fool of himself trying to snub everybody. Washington said that black Angelinos would not be inviting Du Bois back and that none of them had anything positive to say about him. Washington concluded <laughs> that the best way to eliminate any competition from Du Bois was to let him meet people all over the country. <laughs> there is no doubt that Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois tremendously impacted the African American community in Los Angeles. While Du Bois romanticized the status of African Americans throughout the city, he really only focused on the elite sectors of the community, thereby concluding that life was indeed better in Los Angeles and California than any other place place in America. Washington's motives were quite different. He was primarily interested in promoting Tuskegee. While he did raise a few thousand dollars for his institution, he also maintained a close relationship with many black Angelinos until his death in 1915. African Americans not only supported Washington and Du Bois, but many people joined Marcus Garvey's United Negro Improvement Association. They took what they needed from the national leadership and adapted those, um, those things to their own community. Black Angelinos had several of their own leaders who shaped the community, such as Charlotta Bass and Jefferson Edmonds, who both owned and operated um, two of the city's black newspapers, William J. Seymour, who led the multi-ethnic, multi-racial Azusa Street Revival, Joseph and Eliza Young, who were both members, members of several clubs, such as the YMCA and the California State Association of Colored Women, respectively. Georgia Robinson became the first black policewoman in America in 1919 and then became the first black social worker in Los Angeles. Black Angelinos had a long history of leadership that can be traced back to the first families of African descent. Those who arrived in Los Angeles at the beginning of the 20th century were able to reap the benefits of much earlier gains made by African Americans since the 1850s. It was during the late 19th century that African Americans fought and won rights to education and voting and also housing access. Now I'd like to talk about two families that illustrate some of my findings about leadership in the African American community in Los Angeles. My first story highlights the ways in which black Angelinos were able to attain great success. It underscores the kind of leadership roles that African American women played and shows how early migrants laid the foundation for later generations of African American settlers. This is the story of perhaps the most illustrious and influential African American in the 19th century, Biddy Mason. Bridget Biddy Mason was born a slave in 1818 in the cotton producing California with, um, by her slave owner, Robert Smith, who basically left the South with a group of Mormons on an expedition um, to find um, their Garden of Eden, which was Utah that they settled in. He decided he didn't want to stay in Utah and he came to California. He brought Biddy and another slave named Hannah with him. In 1856. 
Coming from a slave tradition of female-headed households where women endured most of the responsibility caring for their families, Biddy created a world for herself and her family. Mason and her daughter settled in Los Angeles in the home of Robert Owens, who was also formerly enslaved. Soon she secured a job as a confinement nurse at a salary of $2.50 a day. These wages allowed her to become the head of her own household and acquire property for her family. She began pursuing plots of land throughout the area known today as Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles. Mason held on to those properties until they were worth yielding a good return. She bought one plot of land for $250, for example, and later sold it for $18,000. And this is the area near where she owned her land. Soon, Mason began um, using her, own, her growing fortune to help the black community. Mason's real estate decisions created a dynasty for both her children and the generations that followed. As they grew increasingly wealthy, the Masons became one of the most influential families, black or white, in Los Angeles. Newspaper editor Charlotta Bass noted that the Mason family was not only one of the wealthiest, but also one of the most respected. In 1909, the Mason family investments um, were worth $300,000. I mean, yeah, $300,000. Mason's daughters, Ellen, Harriet, and her grandsons managed them all. Their status in Los Angeles signified the amount of power and influence Mason had, making it easy for her to establish many community institutions and opportunities for, for African Americans. Mason established female leadership much earlier than Washington or Du Bois. She stressed helping the less fortunate, she touched the lives of many individuals, and she created institutions that helped entire families and the larger African-American community. When Biddy Mason died, her obituary acknowledged her as a, as a community leader, as a woman who overcame adversity, and as a generous caregiver. She actually founded and worked in the city's first day nursery, a facility to take care of both orphans and the less advantaged African-Americans. Biddy Mason was an exemplary philanthropist. She created ways to help people temporarily, giving them an opportunity to settle in the city. Mason often went to the local grocer, for example, and arranged to help people secure food and other provisions. Her agreement stipulated her guarantee to extend credit to those who could not afford their purchases. She also built a boarding house on her South Spring Street property. She routinely visited prisoners in the local jail, as well as patients in asylums and hospitals. Mason is particularly known for providing funds to secure the property for the first African-American church in the city, Fame. As word spread about her charitable works, people traveled great distances to ask Biddy Mason for help. Her daughters, Ellen and Harriet, and eventually her grandchildren carried her legacy forward. Like Biddy Mason, Robert Owens also accumulated a great deal of wealth by purchasing land in addition to investing in several businesses. Taking advantage of the real estate boom in the city in the years following Reconstruction, Owens, who had purchased his freedom um, after moving um, from Texas in 1850, worked with his wife Winnie to build a small fortune. At first, the two took on several menial jobs. Owens finally secured a government contract to sell livestock and wood to the local military. This allowed him to accumulate capital and purchase major amounts of land, just as his female counterpart. Owens purchased land on San Pedro Street and a livery stable that he used for his business. His oldest son, oldest son Charles, managed both the property and business. Owens maintained the lead position as the wealthiest African-American man in Los Angeles until his death in 1865. These families increased their worth even more when the two children married. Robert Owens' eldest son, Charles, married Ellen in 1866. Together, the two continued the legacy of their parents, purchasing land throughout Los Angeles. During this pre-restrictive covenant era, Ellen and Charles were able to make purchases throughout the city rather than confining themselves to only one section of Los Angeles. Not only did this tactic increase their income and personal wealth, it also affected the amount of influence and respect they had. Charles um, and Ellen Owens had two sons, Robert and Henry. 
Robert Curry Owens also purchased properties as his primary means of wealth accumulation and became extremely successful at it. And you can see this is a business block that he owned. In 1893, uh, Robert married Anna Drudger and they had two daughters, Gladys and Manila. Robert C. Owens became incredibly wealthy, thus many influential leaders of the National African American community recognized his accomplishments. Owens also supported many local and national African American institutions. Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois agreed that Robert C. Owens played a significant role in easing the plight of African Americans in the West. When Booker T. Washington visited um, in 1903, Owens organized a dinner for him with a number of influential black Angelinos. He also donated $120 to Tuskegee Institute, a gift that matched funds raised by other African Americans in Los Angeles. In 1905, Colored Magazine labeled him the wealthiest man west of Chicago. Du Bois also spent a great deal of time with Owens and published those photos. So that picture that you just saw was from that, um, that edition of the Crisis Magazine. When Booker T. Washington returned to Los Angeles in 1914, he spent a great deal of time with the Owens family. On March 8th, he met with the same delegation that brought Du Bois to Los Angeles. This time, Washington collected several thousand dollars from the Owens friends and family. The second visit to Los Angeles highlights the lasting relationship the Owens family maintained with Booker T. Washington. Owens, Owens believed the best way to advance the race was by reaching out to the interracial and multi-ethnic community. By June 1914, Owens and a small group of wealthy in the Los Angeles Times. This was accomplished with the help of Booker T. Washington. In July, Wa um, Washington wrote to the owner of the newspaper, Harrison Gray Otis, on behalf of LA's black community and made the request. Within days, Otis responded that he would allow the black community to publish a segment noting their worthwhile achievements. By mid-August, black Angelinos had submitted their first installment to the Times. Robert C. Owens and his family maintained the legacy of philanthropy that his grandmother began. He also believed that there were several ways to advance the race, but that also relied on multicultural cooperation to some extent. While Owens was very successful, other black Angelinos believed that all black towns would be better of African Americans, one of whom was Colonel Allen Allensworth, co-founder of Allensworth, California. And these are images of Allensworth. Allen Allensworth was born a slave in Kentucky in 1840. During the Civil War, he escaped to join the Union Army. After serving for a number of years as chaplain, Allensworth um, was stationed in California at the Presidio of San Francisco. While Colonel, while Colonel Allensworth was serving in active duty in the Philippine-American War, his wife Josephine oversaw the paychecks of military families at the Presidio, ensuring that the wives and children of soldiers um, would receive the money that their husbands sent back home. In 1905, Colonel Allensworth moved his family to Los Angeles, where they purchased a home not far from the Owens family. The couple had two daughters, Nella, who married a building contractor named um, Louis Blodgett, and Eva, who married Harry Skanks, a clerk at the post office. In Los Angeles, Allensworth, along with four other men, organized the California Colony and Home Promoting Association, a company that promoted black home ownership and self-sufficiency. Since Los Angeles had, established, uh, had an established African-American community, Allensworth decided to look for a large portion of land for black people to establish their own separate colony where African-Americans could enjoy economic prosperity and live free of discriminatory laws. Several black towns already existed in California. In 1908, the group located a large tract in the San Joaquin Valley, just north of Bakersfield. They believed that the area was a perfect place for establishing an all-black town, much like those that, were already, that already existed in Kansas and in Oklahoma since um, the 1870s. They named the town Allensworth after its most well-known co-founder. The location of the town was very important because it was perfectly situated between Los Angeles and San Francisco. But more importantly, the Santa Fe Railroad had a transfer stop for cattle farmers at Allensworth. 
The town opened a bakery right at the stop in order to attract businesses. They also built stores, a school, a library, a hotel, and a church to meet the needs of the townspeople. The location was believed to be good farmland for sugar beets, dairy, poultry, and other goods. While the town initially had 10 residents in 1912, it quickly grew to over 100. Colonel Allensworth divided his time between the town and Los Angeles, where he recruited families for the colony. Not only did he advertise in the African American newspapers across the country, Allensworth believed that black Angelinos shared many of his ideas about the kinds of people who could live in the colony. Allensworth su stressed self-sufficiency in education as two of the most important principles. He focused on recruiting families rather than single people, men with military backgrounds, and people with strong middle-class values who were also church members. His wife Josephine organized the Women's Improvement Club, which established a playground for the children and oversaw several improvement projects. She also became the first president of the, of the school board and donated the building for the town's library, while her husband gave his personal book collection. Allensworth did not tolerate drunkards, gamblers, or prostitutes. Allensworth envisioned a town that adhered to Protestant and middle class values in ways that other utopian communities were exclusive. The majority of people who lived in Allensworth were farmers, shopkeepers, and rail railroad workers. Family sizes were small, averaging three or fewer people per household, and unlike Los Angeles, very few of them lived in homes with non-family members. Although the majority of um, households in Allensworth were headed by men, very few single women lived in the town. The Excuse me, I'm sorry. Very few single women lived in the town between 1908 and 1920, but there were some um, widows who were the heads of their own households. And I mean, some is like three. <laughs> the, the majority of Allensworth women um, did not work outside of their homes, but they may have helped their husbands um, on family farms and those kinds of things. The Allensworth Colony Association proposed an establishment for an industrial school that would be known as the Tuskegee of the West, not a Fisk or an Atlanta University. Residents began raising money for the school, but it never developed because many wealthy black Angelinos, especially members of the Niagara Movement and the NAACP, would not support it. Since African Americans in California had fought so hard for their children to attend integrated schools, and because Angelinos experienced a higher degree of freedom and equality, they wouldn't support a segregated black school. Allensworth attracted several families in the beginning, but simply could not, ex could not sustain itself for several reasons. First, water was a major problem. The utility companies that controlled the water supply were closed down due to unpaid taxes. The land had several artesian wells, and they petitioned the state for gas-powered pumps, but they were denied. The water supply to the town began drying up by the late 1920s. In addition, high levels of alkali were found, and everything turned to salt when the water table dropped. Therefore, the water was useless. As a result, people moved out of the town to find opportunity in Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay. The second major problem for Allensworth occurred in 1914 um, when the Santa Fe Railroad Company moved its stop to Alpa, which was seven miles down the road. This left people without an ability to sell their goods and services in Allensworth, thereby cutting off the families that remained. Also, the First World War and the sudden increase in factory work called people away from the small black colony to the cities. Finally, in 1914, Colonel Allensworth was struck down by a motorcyclist and died on his way to preach at a church just outside of Los Angeles, which was also another significant blow to the town's growth. Josephine Allensworth continued to visit the town, but lived with one of her daughters in Los Angeles. By 1920, Allensworth was no longer an all-black town. Of the 48 fam remaining families, an additional six were including people from Germany, Switzerland, and Barbados. Allensworth suggests how people were stuck between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Allensworth wanted the 
community, but also believed in the principles of hard work, self-sufficiency, and respectability. This, he believed, could only be achieved through living in separate communities where black children attended schools and received an industrial and agricultural education. Even in his promoting of the town, he solicited soldiers, not scholars, and farmers rather than doctors and lawyers, many of whom drew upon agricultural skills brought with them from the South. During the 19th century, the African American population in Los Angeles remained small. Those who arrived between, 18, between the 1850s and 1880s were able to etch out a nice existence. They created a community that was sustained by home ownership and a degree of economic viability, even if it was relatively disadvantaged. They also established institutions such as black-owned businesses and formed independent churches and social organizations. They opened hotels and offered accommodations for new migrants. They purchased land, especially in the downtown area of the city. Community life. All of these things allowed black Angelinos to meet the needs of the community. Some addressed middle class needs while others addressed the working poor. By the beginning of the First World War, African Americans in Los Angeles had established a strong community, but just after the turn of the century, black Angelinos faced housing segregation and other forms of discrimination. Those who arrived early established themselves within the larger community. Others relied on one another, their church organizations, African American charitable institutions such as clubs, as well as other groups of people of color and ethnically defined whites to maintain their own institutions and sense of community in Los Angeles. The local black leadership drew its strength from a number of resources. First, in the same tradition of early black settlers, later from black Angelinos who supported both national and local leader leaders. They adapted rather than adopted racial uplift ideologies to meet the needs of the community at the appropriate W.E.B. Du Bois impact. It is equally important, as this paper notes, to consider the relationship between um, Booker T. Washington and the black Angelino community at the beginning of the 20th century. So thank you, and at this time I'd like to um, take questions. Kelly. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you. And of course, we know quite a bit about Du Bois and his visits to yeah. Los Angeles. And I didn't know quite as much about Washington. So um, I really thought a lot from the talk. And I noticed that you said Washington visited in 1903. So I'm wondering if there's a th if you can talk to us a little bit more about the this is the year when the socialist movement is really mm -hmm. picking up steam, taking over city politics. Um, George Washington Woodby is a very important black preacher socialist. So I'm wondering if you could talk to us about the black radical critique in Los Angeles that is somewhere outside of Du Bois and Washington in this time period, the black socialist critique in particular. Well, or is Woodby sort of just out with the white socialists and not part of the black community? <laughs> I guess there are a couple. Of, I mean, there are a couple of things to think about, and one, I guess, is sort of in the same vein that you know, like Mark Wilde writes about in in terms of the street meeting. That you know, you have people sort of from different backgrounds that come together um, and join. I, I guess my point is that that there would be some black people that would join that that sort of white, <laughs> I don't want to call it that, but white radical movement, right, or, or move away from that. But what I, what I, I kind of, um, and, and, then, and certainly it's important to note that um, a lot of the neighborhoods were much more integrated than people think, right? So you have um, black people living in homes, in the households of white people who most likely would be um, coming from those traditions and, and possibly embrace those traditions on the one hand. Um, on another idea um, about that or another way of looking at it is to consider, um, and, I, and I guess this is sort of what I do when I talk about the Azusa Street Revival, which occurs, uh, it begins three years um, later, right, from this visit. And the Azusa Street Revival sort of 
fits and meets those needs for a lot of people. It's founded by African Americans and it grows and it's multiracial and multiethnic. And so I think in a lot of ways that, um, that this is where a lot of black people sort of found or embraced these notions um, of, of socialism and, and those kinds of things. The black community as, as you know, at large, though the larger community, is less likely to embrace these ideologies and really try to suppress as much as they possibly could any agenda that didn't really fit in the um, sort of more, um, you know, middle class Protestant. They really, they really didn't want to act as though they um, at at this time. I mean, it changes drastically in the next decade. But at this time, they really don't want to act as though that they're, they're a part of anything that is radical or challenging. And they also wanted to kind of lay low, <laughs> in the sense that they weren't being targeted um, like the Mexicans were, like the Chinese or the Japanese were. So they wanted to kind of lay low and go with the flow with the mainstream. So, so you don't, I haven't found, I should say, a lot of discussion about that or promotion of this agenda during this sort of pre-World War I time. Um, but that's not to say that it doesn't occur and that there aren't especially working class people that are, that are embracing these ideologies. Juliet. <laughs> Um, you stated when Booker T. Washington and W. E. Du Bois came out to California, they both had their own ideological ideological views on Los Angeles and black people in Los Angeles. But you stated that um, W. E. Du Bois had he was wrong about some things. What was it that he was wrong about? Oh, thank you for that question. Uh, thanks, Mark. <laughs> they um, Du Bois was. Du Bois really only looked at the elite, okay? He looked at some of the working class people, but he, he, he sort of, what he saw in terms of working class here was that they were better off than, say, in Northern California, and therefore they were okay. Right, um, and and that they had institutions that were there that helped them. But what he didn't see was that there was real poverty here, and that you know black that there were black people that were struggling to find you know housing and jobs and those kinds of things. But that they they you know he I guess and on the one hand he focused on the fact that they created these institutions to help, right? But on the other hand he he just sort of thought that all black people had equal opportunity and that they could take advantage of it here. So speaking, you know, relatively to other places that he had visited, like Philadelphia, um, like what his life was like in Atlanta and what he saw there, um, he could say that it was that it was better, so it's all relative. But um, but really he completely misses the black poor and those black poor are living in um, the same neighborhoods as I, as I just mentioned. They're living in, in, in neighborhoods with immigrant whites. And he doesn't go to those neighborhoods. And so he doesn't really see what their life is like. Um, he, doesn't know, he doesn't notice the Azusa Street Revival, which is still going on at the time. Um, he's really focused on the elite churches, the middle class churches. Um, and he actually comes here to help one of those churches, those middle class churches, raise money um, because they had been uh, unfairly fined by the city um, and so that was kind of like his main purpose was to help those that were already in the elite sector um, the other thing that he you know that I, I don't I, I haven't said that he also, he was also wrong about I think um, for the time was that he was really suspicious of people of Asian descent and he saw that as being a major major problem for African Americans well he, he he just said that he, he basically warned, right, in this piece that they, um, that they could cause a lot more competition for the black community. Even though there had been all of these efforts to, you know, get rid of these communities of people of Asian descent during that time. Darnell. Really, really exciting talk. Um, I'm going to follow up on a, on, a, on a point that I think Kelly raised a little bit earlier when you were talking about, you know, us knowing a lot more about Du Bois and his visit to LA and a lot less about uh, Washington. I, I wasn't familiar. I, I knew he had made visits here, but mm -hmm. I not much about it. Um, and it seems like the debate between Du Bois and Washington and the difference with philosophies and how, how the, the race was to move forward and so forth and so on. Um, 
what was happening in LA and Black LA during that period would seem to be an interesting, I don't want to say test case, but certainly mm -hmm. an opportunity to kind of see which philosophy or approach might yeah. be out. And, and, and so we get the sense, I think, of what Du Bois thought about LA and yeah. almost presenting it as this mecca and what could happen if we you are able to move the talented tenth ahead and so forth and so mm -hmm. forth. But what does Washington make of the case of Black <laughs> How does it fit into his philosophy, into his argument, and his attempts to kind of yeah. move his agenda forward? Well, thank you for that question, Dr. Hunt, because, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's really interesting um, when, I, when I read how great Du Bois says California is, especially Los Angeles. Washington, not so much. He says the best place for black people to live is in the South. You know, he's a southerner, he loves the South, but, um, but he spends so much time with, with these people who, on the one hand, they, they don't seem to like Du Bois, right? And so, so he, he kind of identifies with them on that level. And then the other thing that he does is he visits all of these educational institutions, and he meets with the state teachers and, and all of these different kinds of things. So for that part of it, he really, I mean, this is, this is also part of, you know, Washington's ideology that we, we only brush over in saying, well, he wanted to train people industrial education, agricultural education, um, wanted people to work, you know. And so, so he, he's impressed that black people are really working hard here and they're maintaining, you know, their own um, homes and those kinds of things. And they're sending their kids to school. And so those things he, he really kind of thought gelled right with the community and the community seemed to embrace him in those ways also except for them when it came to you know establishing this this black institution at Allensworth to which you know that's when they kind of put the brakes on and said no that's not going to happen so um, so I think that you know a, a little of each but at the same time I have to say that Biddy Mason really helped to establish and lay the foundation for what the black community was going to be doing in terms of leadership. And she comes from, you know, pretty much the same place that um, that that um, Washington comes from in terms of, you know, she comes from the South, she had to work her way up and those kinds of things. And it seems as though during this period, that's what people are, are really sort of um, um, feeling most comfortable with, you know. Um, and again, I really think, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier, um, is this early period, black people really didn't want to uh, make waves for the community by doing anything radical. And so, and they had the right to vote in California um, on paper, right? And I looked at the, um, the voter registration records um, for Allensworth um, for the few decades that it was there. And every adult was registered to vote, male and female. And so, you know, this was not something that they were terribly worried about. And, and they had the support of the LA Times for a while. They had the support of other white newspapers. So I think a lot of the things that, that were on Du Bois' agenda, they had already checked it off of their list, so to speak. Um, I'm interested in, I didn't, I didn't realize that Allensworth actually had lived in Los Angeles prior to creating the all-black town, and you mm -hmm. mentioned something about other all-black towns in California at the time, and so I'm very familiar with the ones in Kansas and also in Oklahoma, sort of along the way, but I didn't realize that it was such a movement. Is it a movement in California during this time? And you know, why would Allensworth, who was, you know, very well established and already, you know, well off financially and had social status, why would he, do you think, suggest that African Americans move into an all black town? Was it that he saw something in terms of the treatment of African Americans in Los Angeles he thought could be improved by moving to the all black town? Does that resonate with other people creating all black towns in Los Angeles? Mm -hmm. California at the time. Sure. Well, um, you know, so there are there are four um, all black towns n at the time in um, in in California. So one of them is north of Allensworth, still in the Central Valley, but it's I think it's north of Fresno, near Fresno. Allensworth is in between Fresno and Bakersfield. For those of you who drive up the 99, um, so. 
so there were kind of two Central Valley locations, but there were also two Southern California locations. One was um, in this area that's that's kind of where Carson is now, so just outside of Los Angeles, and the other one is where Victorville is, which is San Bernardino County. So that's about an hour's drive, hour and fifteen minutes drive from here, or four hours in traffic. Um, so, so. Um, so on the one hand, I think for Allensworth, he had some challenges because people who, who embraced this idea of an all-black town had already moved um, to these other areas. And, and, and there weren't tons of them, but there were significant enough to have their own communities. Um, and, and we know, I think, that we, it only requires a few families, right, to establish a community. So they weren't, um, they, they weren't, huge or anything like that. Um, but Allensworth, what he sees in Los Angeles, I, I believe, um, are a couple of things. I think that he, you know, again, he comes from the same place as Washington and as, as Mason. He's, he comes from the South. He was enslaved and all of that. And he really does, and he, everything he does in the military is to help black soldiers. To, he teaches them how to read. He holds church service. His wife is helping the wives and the children at home and those kinds of things. So I think he sort of sees an opportunity to continue that, but in the vein of having these, this black colony that would be successful um, in ways that other black colonies weren't. You get the middle class there instead of the working poor. And then you send those children, you know, they wanted a school, but you send those children, um, you know, off to good schools and they come back and they give back to the community and it's going to be free of any kinds of problems that the poor, you know, and, air quotes, would bring. And so, um, you know, the, the location for Allensworth, I guess in some ways was unfortunate. It was good because they found all this land, but really they wanted to do it here in Los Angeles, but there was no land for them in some cases, and in other cases people wouldn't sell them the land. Mm -hmm. So, um, but he really saw this as a place where black people could, could sort of have a better community just all to themselves and do the same things that they were doing here in Los Angeles. Black Angelinos weren't necessarily supportive of that because they were already established and things were not necessarily as bad as they could have, you know, as they could have been, right? Um, and everybody wasn't interested in farming their own land, all, you know, and, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, you have all these business people and, and professionals that, you know, he couldn't convince to come there and, you know, raise sugar beets. Um, or to support the college. Or to support the college, yeah. That, would, that, was, the fir that was one of the first fights was, I mean, it was not a college that, um, that they were fighting for first in California, but it was for school desegregation. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the, um, the middle class and wealthy black Angelinos were already sending their children to, um, you know, to Berkeley. They were sending them to USC. They were sending them um, to the California State Normal School, which becomes UCLA. So, you know, they, they already had that access that he um, was trying to provide. Thank you. Yeah. Um, first, thank you for a really fascinating talk. And I was really intrigued by when you mentioned that Owens was able to secure that column in the LA Times. Yeah. And that's so fascinating to me. I was thinking about the longer history of the LA Times and its <laughs> antagonistic relationship with mm -hmm. the communities, other communities of color. I was curious, how long did that column last? And <laughs> what was the relationship between that column and the Times by the time um, California Eagle was published? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, the um, <laughs> interestingly, the column is it's there, but it doesn't last for a long time, but before they established this column, they were already highlighting, you know, things, um, you know, mentionable things or, or great things about the black community, right? And so, um, so there are some years where they're 
putting things, even um, I had a slide from, it was actually in commemoration of Lincoln's birthday, that they had all of these things about the black community, but that was before this letter and before this, this happened, right? So it was actually kind of a better thing for them before <laughs> they got the official okay to do this. But Harrison Gray Otis was very skeptical of doing this because he felt black people had criticized him for not being supportive of the community. And so he writes to um, Booker T. Washington and he says okay we're going to do this but then he says but I will not tolerate being you know being um, mistreated and ta you know talked uh, poorly about and all of these other kinds of criticized <laughs> and all of that kind of stuff and so you know so the relationship is not good from the beginning and um, you know Edmonds and Bass, they, they recognize this. And Charlotta Bass arrives in 19, um, 1910, and the California Eagle was already in existence. She had, this is actually her first job. She then goes on to take it over. So the black newspapers in the city and in, in, in the state um, were just kind of doing their own thing because they already knew that this was going to happen with the newspaper. And they always had this adversary relationship, I think, is, is, is the, the answer to the question, right? And so I just thought it was quite interesting to see that, you know, they, they really weren't, um, um, the newspaper, the Times that is, really wasn't interested in supporting this idea. So other outlets was a much better idea. Thank you. Okay, we want to thank Marnie I have, for, well, can I just have one more question really quickly? Yeah, one more. Okay, thank you. I just was struck by, because I'm a gardener, <laughs> uh, that, um, that there Du Bois and Book to Washington both talk about the sensuous beauty of California and mm -hmm. the ability to grow things and you know the orange trees, which is a lot of people when they visit they think about this. But it, it opens up this kind of window in the way to, to look into which we often don't think about how the environment impacts mm -hmm. psychologically African Americans, you know, or even practically, mm -hmm. most of them coming from the South and that kind of thing. So, um, do you see that other people in the community um, or who might Great are also impressed or are affected by this quote unquote sensuous view. Is it like a garden <laughs> as far as they're concerned? Yeah, it is. And, you know, I'll give you just a couple really quick examples. One is um, I found um, one of the, the letters that um, one of the stu a student who was traveling with Booker T. Washington um, wrote about their first trip to Los Angeles. And he could not stop you know, gushing about how great it is. And they get here, um, they get here, uh, oh gosh, what did I say, that they came in January. They get here at New Year's, okay? So the, this is January, well, February now, right? But this is the weather in Southern California. So he gets here and he goes, you know, I realized right away that you don't talk to people in Los Angeles about the weather because it's almost like you're um, jinxing it, you know? He says people are, people are really kind of, you know, they, they don't want you to, to bad mouth the weather because something bad will have, they might get rain or something. But, so they were really excited about that. And the other thing that they were really excited about was when they were going, when they were traveling, they went out to Ontario and they went to Pomona College and stuff. And he, um, he was saying how they just stopped on the side of the road to pick oranges. And that he was talking about these are, these are oranges. These are not like what any kind of fruit that you get in the South. They, and they, they picked grapefruit, they picked, you know, they saw a bunch of olive trees, and those kinds of things people were just amazed by. And then I, 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 noted, I noticed that um, Booker T. Washington is writing to his family and he's sending them boxes of oranges that you can have here, you know, in California, right? And this is like in the middle of the year, let me send you, you know, oranges and, and things like that. Um, People came to California because, you know, some people came to California because of the weather, and people came to Los Angeles specifically for the weather. Charlotte Bass was one of them. She was from Rhode Island, and she was ill, and her doctor told her she needed to go to a warmer climate to get better. And so she came here, and immediately, you know, she was healed. And um, it turns out that a lot of people would do that. But when they came here, they also discovered that the, there are these other advantages. For example, you could have, um, you know, people who move from larger cities or more rural areas were able to buy property, and on that property they could grow a garden. 
you know, and you could have your garden almost all year round. You could raise your own chickens, you could raise your own fruit trees, and there's a lot of discussion about the fruit trees in a lot of these, um, these letters from visitors to Los Angeles. And so you could sustain yourself in, in ways that, you know, I guess in, some, in ways that you wouldn't have to go off to farmland out in the middle of nowhere hence Allensworth, or, um, you know, just have something small in, you know, in your yard if you wanted to go and pick oranges and lemons and those kinds of things. Thank you. <laughs> what, just my the yards were not necessarily small. You know. Right. Quite mm -hmm. my grandparents came to Monrovia for mm -hmm. those reasons. Yeah. They had a huge, huge farm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Three or four acres. Like, right. You know, yeah. They had pigs and yeah. crops, and they were just, you know, as happy as could be. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a backyard little. Right. No. It was. A, it was a.